Don't you realize? The next time you see Sky, it'll be over another town. The next time you take a test, it'll be in some other school. Our parents, they want the best of stuff for us. But right now they gotta do what's right for them. Cause it's their time. Their time. Up there. Down here, it's our time. It's our time down here. That's all over the second we ride up Troy's bucket. Yeah. You ready to go? I'm ready. All right. Hello, podcast audience, and thank you so much for joining us for the second ever episode of the Telling Stories podcast. If you listened to the first episode, thank you. That was nice of you. Uh, If you're here for the second episode, you're in for a treat, as I think this is where it's going to get really good. As fun as the first episode was for for me and my co-host, Rick Maxidon. Hi there. I think that that was a fun episode for us to record, but and it was necessary, but this is really, I think, where our heart is, is diving into these narratives. Right, right. It was like preparing the meal yeah. and now we get to eat the meal now now we get to eat and so as we eat today we're going to uh we're going to go through the goonies mm-hmm. um one of my absolute favorite films it's on my what i call my canon of movies All right um <clears throat> if you don't know that term canon it's not about a camera look it up <laughs> you've got a phone so the goonies circa 1985 I was born in 1986, so this movie's older than I am, but I'm still one of my absolute favorites. 1985, I was still crying about the Don Dinkinger making a bad call at first base. <laughs> yeah, that's well. 1985, in the, in the Cardinals of St. Louis. Yeah. Big year, 1985, I believe. That's when Back to the Future, the first Back to the Future came out, too. There we go. Wow, good that's year. right. Yeah. Preparing the way for me in 1986. <laughs> so, uh, as we go through some of these movies, if you haven't seen The Goonies, pause this podcast, go to your TV. I think it's like four bucks on, on Prime Video. You can yeah. rent it. And iTunes. Rudy's in it. Yeah, Rudy Rudiger. Yeah, Sean as Oth- the main Sean char- character. So, so setting up all each of these movies that we go through. Do you ever go to the Rotten Tomatoes website when you? Oh yeah, all the time. It's great. Absolutely, it's really good. And so, right. take it with a grain of salt because I always do. But I just want to, as we introduce a movie, I think I thought it would be fun to just start with the Rotten Tomatoes scores. Cool, sounds great. And so there's two scores. If you if you're familiar at all with Rotten Tomatoes, you've got the Tomato Meter, which is the critical analysis. Mm-hmm. It's a, it's a some kind of an algorithm they use to combine all of the critical analysis of the film. Algorithm. There's a word that, like, it's in the vernacular all over the place now. And Everybody uses algorithm. Ago, exactly, right. Yeah. right. yeah. There's an algorithm you had to, be a to math create nerd. algorithm. Yeah. <laughs> you had to be a math nerd to know that word. Right. And now it's like, oh, it's yeah, Facebook has an algorithm, Instagram right. has an algorithm, yeah. YouTube has an algorithm. Marketing. Marketers know algorithms. Mm-hmm. So, the critical combination being the, t- the tomato meter... 70% for Is the it Goonies. tomato meter or thermometer? Well, can, I, I'm just I, going on. I went back and forth I'm on this I'm digressing for you. Thermometer sounds very intellectual. To, we'll go with that. <laughs> right. I, wanna, I want to sound intellectual. So the thermometer at 70%, which is, you know, very criti- critics are very honest when they review films. Uh-huh. And so I think a 70% or more from, from that score is generally pretty good. Right. Yeah, absolutely. They're not afraid. It's not like a it's not like a test where everyone's going to get over fifty percent. Like, mm-hmm. you, yeah, I've seen scores down in the single digits. On oh that. yeah, right. So they don't hold blockbuster back. movies. Yeah, yeah, they don't hold scores it back. in the single digits. So, so a thermometer of seventy percent, I think, is is good. Okay. Um, the audience score, though, is where I usually identify more with a film. Okay. Right. Generally speaking. Yeah. I generally associate more with the audience score than I do okay. the critical analysis, which is uh, another good dichotomy for yeah. us because I'm I'm the opposite. Okay, that's, I think, that's perfect. I think we have a culture of sheep who like things because people tell them to like things. Well, I believe that too. Yeah. But still, I, I still find myself associating more with so right. the audience score. So we had seventy percent from the critics. The audience gave it a ninety-one percent. Both good scores. Very good. So, point of that being, the Goonies is very well received universally. Right. So, um. Directed by Richard Donner. Uh, Richard Donner is probably best known for the Goonies, but his you know one B. If if the Goonies is one A, his one B is the Superman series, mm-hmm. uh, the Christopher Reeve super. So, going back to when I was a kid, like right, you know, we're not talking about Henry Cavill here, like right. you know, who just made waves for leaving the the DC universe as Superman. If you knew that, all all those all those comic book universe things, I I I don't spend much time with. So <laughs> I'm just going to take either. your word for it. I don't know a lot either. So. 
Going back to Superman is Christopher Reeve. Christopher Reeve, you know, is is Superman. From the fortress of solitude to the bustling city room of the Daily Planet, look up on the screen. It's Superman. Um, So Richard Donner did all three of those Superman movies. Uh, he also did the Lethal Weapon series, which was those are classics. Pretty classic '80s series, yeah. and they, I think those went into the '90s even as yeah. well. Yeah, there's a lot of them. Yeah, I think Lethal Weapon Eight made it into the '90s. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> and then a little film that I liked back in the day called Maverick. One yeah, the, like, another Mel Gibson yeah. movie, card movie. Yeah, it is good true. stuff. Yeah, so those are Richard Donner movies. Um, so there's actually a scene in the Goonies. So I, we need to tell like there's going to be spoilers here. So if you've not seen the Goonies. I, that's on you at this point. Right, right. There's, that's on you. There is a, there's like a, uh, a time limit here. It, yeah. Like if you've, you've had plenty of time, it's, it was 1985. Yeah, so I think you've anything that's more there. than like a year or two old here, like I have no hard feelings spoiling it. Right. Because one, the title of the movie we're viewing is in the title of this podcast. And there's, so. there's, a, there's a little button on your, pod, on your phone right now with two like vertical yeah. uh, lines. Universally next to, known that's as called the pause, the pause button. button. Yeah. You can do that and then come back. Yeah. So movies are more readily available through services like iTunes and, and uh, Amazon and Google now than they have ever been. So I don't feel bad for spoiling this for you. Right. But at the end of The Goonies, in the scene where they discover One-Eyed Willie's ship, Sloth wears a Superman shirt. He tears and it he open. He tears it open, and and I, and when I was a kid, I never realized that Richard Donner was a common thread between yeah. the Superman franchise. I didn't and either the, until till yeah. this podcast. So so I thought Sloth was you know maybe the S was for Sloth in this context, yeah. or he just felt like Superman rescuing the kids off the <clears throat> ship from his family. Yeah, but I you know in, in retrospect that was a pretty little you know it was a nice little Easter egg, little, a little nod, nod yeah. to his work as uh, the director of Superman. It was Easter eggs before there were such things as yeah. Easter eggs. <laughs> Easter eggs pre Ready Player One. Yeah. So, uh, talking about things we necessarily didn't know when we watched this the mm-hmm. first time, or going back, I, I hadn't seen the Goonies in probably ten years when I when yeah, I, decided it, to do I this. think I saw it when it first came out, and that was yeah. it. So, it, a nice little refresher was had by both. And when I was yeah. when I was watching it, you know, a couple weeks ago in preparation to this, I I saw Steven Spielberg's name in the opening credits. Right. And I did not. Uh, this is not a movie that I associate with Steven Spielberg. So, doing some research, this is actually... Steven Spielberg is responsible for the, the original story for The Goonies. Yeah. He didn't write the screenplay, but he was the creator of the story, and then he has an executive producer credit on it. And, like, doing a little research, he actually had some significant... I think he directed some of the scenes, even, and... When I sat down to watch role. it, and his name popped, I'm like, oh, it is makes that right? Sense. Oh, you're, yeah, to- it makes total sense. So, so, knowing Spielberg and his style, and, like, going back and watching The Goonies, I'm like, yeah, this is... Definitely, got it's very similar to Raiders of the Lost Ark, yes. and it's like its themes it's and the way it moves, and, and yeah, there's like adventure and the way comedy kind of interacts. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, so clearly a Spielberg movie, but it, it is not one that I think often gets yeah. associated with Spielberg. You know, when yeah. you think about Spielberg's, you know, Hall of Fame, right? The Goonies is not something that's probably ever mentioned, right? But it. It's kind of maybe a, a breeding ground for him, a, yeah. a learning curve for him, yeah. So anyway, Richard Donner, Steven Spielberg, they work together on this movie. Um, Which, those two things alone ought to make you want to go watch <laughs> go it if watch you haven't. Mo- I'm those serious. Two if, guys. You're watching, if you're still listening and you haven't watched this, shame on you. Yeah. Uh, this movie, and this is another, again, watching this as a kid, something I completely did not appreciate, but going back and watching it in my adulthood, you see a lot of really familiar actors. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, this is a film that launched some careers yeah. that have staying power to this day. Yeah. So the first one being, you know, when I think of '80s movies, it's how, how do you not think about Sean Astin? Yeah, he was the most famous pirate in his time. My dad told me all about him once. Right. Absolutely. So, so Sean Astin, if you're unfamiliar, has 141 acting credits to his name, according to our good friends at IMDb. Um, this what a great go- website, by the way. It's very rich in knowledge. And and we will reference IMDb I'm in every on one IMDb of these right now. <laughs> every one of these episodes. Um, this was this was Sean Astin's third career acting gig, and I think the first two were pretty insignificant. So this was really his first feature film. Yeah. Um. So if you don't know Sean Astin, if you've seen the Lord of the Rings, he was Samwise Samwise Gamgee. You know Samwise. Yeah. Very iconic role. Right. My first, but probably the most, you know. The strongest identity I draw from Sean Astin is Rudy Rudiger. Oh, 100%. Oh, my That's, gosh. When I, saw, when I saw it, oh, yeah. Oh yeah. 
The main Rudy. character is Rudy. It's Rudy Rudiger. He's not Sean Astin. He's Rudy. So if you haven't seen Rudy, again, shame on you. <laughs> um, Sean Astin was really good in this movie. He was really good. He's in a this little movie. kid. I, mean, I don't yeah. know how old he was, but he, he couldn't be more than 14, 15 years old when this was filmed. Right, right. So he's he's really what I think like every kid wants to be who his character was in this movie. Every yeah. like when they're they're young, you want to be you want to go on adventures, but you want to be safe. You want to you want to go pay. on the adventure, take the inhaler. Right. It's like, <laughs> that's that's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> go on the adventure, take the inhaler. That's that should Locking be on a bumper about sticker. Life from that's a that's a tweet right there. Yeah. <laughs> go on an adventure, but it, but like and and he's just so warm in the movie. Um, and I'm assuming that it's like he got some some great direction. Uh, so, yeah. So when when uh, Corey Feldman's character mouth is is teasing us, uh, Corey Chunk, Feldman was playing himself in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when he's teasing uh, uh, Chunk, Chunk, yeah, and making him do the truffle shuffle, yeah. <laughs> who's the first one to jump up and say, "Knock it off, mouth"? Yeah. He has compassion on the fat kid. Right. Yeah. And he's he's just like. He's a curious kid with a warm and tender heart. He loves his family. But like I think that who his character is is a big reason that makes this movie work because he's so good. Do you think it works without him? Um probably not. I mean, they might hard. have been able to find another character, he another did. actor to play that he character. He makes this movie go. Yeah. He gives right. it the heart and then he's kind of like the engine that drives it. Yeah, I, I agree. And he's he's like kind and gentle and and he was every kid yeah i think and it remind this movie reminds me of i don't know this may be dating myself but when i was a kid most of the books that i read were choose your own adventure books I you familiar with those yeah 100% like you read the first part of the story and it says if you choose this go Flip to this page, page. Yeah. do this go to this page 100%. there's like two or three different choices yeah. so this book reminds me of that and and just i just picture him as a little kid in the corner of his room, sitting on a beanbag chair, reading this this adventure book, and and I wouldn't be surprised like that. That, that Donner might have written this, drew some of inspiration from from, from, from that idea. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I mean, I remember after watching this movie, me and my brother, when we were little kids, you know, probably sub ten years old or whatever, <laughs> uh, we would make our own treasure maps. Yeah. Right. And so we would we would have mom brew some tea, and uh-huh. we would take some like paper. We would dabble, dab some tea on it to okay, give it that yellow make it color. Look, yeah. Dry it out with a hair dryer. Okay. Make, and we would make and we would take uh, we would take lighters and like lights. Did you edge. actually bury bury yeah, treasure so we, someplace? So if whoever's living at uh, what was it one fifteen Pool Lane in Illinois, there are little treasures buried in your backyard <laughs> everywhere. What? Give us an example of what one of these treasures might so be. So lots of little Batman toys, probably. Okay. I mean, there's probably some of those Batman toys if you could find them that are worth something. Maybe yeah. not after they've been in the ground <laughs> corroded for by years, yeah. but. Uh, Ninja Turtle toys. Okay. Um, probably little uh, like commemorative coins and okay. things. Okay. Did you put them like in a, a, a school Ziploc bag? Box? Okay. A little Ziploc right. bag, and then we'd bury it. And okay. And then we kept these little treasure maps. All right. Burned edges, tea dyed, and we'd like yeah. we would step it off with our little little kid feet. Right. Um, you know, go to this tree, and then it was like twelve steps to your right from right. this tree, and then. <laughs> So, so and I, whoever like, lives there what, now, there's some treasures buried. That's why I think like every kid has that sort of like, sense especially of boy kids. There, there's this sense of adventure, this desire to to be different. But I think like the 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 goodness and the good nature of Sean Astin's character in this movie is like that's what draws us in because mm-hmm. we're rooting for him. Yeah, we understand the the hardship that he's under. There's we we a, really root hard for him. So there's a naivety to him. Like, yeah. When you know, fourteen, fifteen year old kid thinking, I'm going to save my parents from this financial crisis. We're right. in, the, you know, the golf course is going to take our house. Right. The country club's taking our house to expand the golf course. You know, I I can save my family from this situation if I go on this adventure. Right. So there's that's the the beauty of the movie. There's this naivete with with this character, but there's also some like wisdom. Like he yeah. he knows what he's doing. Even and, even if it is naive, he's not afraid to go for it. Like, right. I think even he realizes it's a long shot. Yeah, but but it's his it's, only shot. But he's got we got to do it. He's yeah. got one more day to to save his family. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So probably maybe the opposite of Sean Astin's character in this movie is his big brother. Yeah. The seventeen year old career acting debut of Josh Brolin. Yeah, Josh Brolin, a great actor, one of my favorite actors today. He's been in a million things. I'm a little yeah. 
70 acting credits on IMDb. So we're talking about two guys that have been in significant amount of movies. Yeah, and and good movies too. Good movies. So he, yeah. you know, most recently in Deadpool 2, he's been Thanos in the Avengers franchise for for all of those that are following modern. Uh, he was Llewellyn Moss in No Country for Old Men. That's that's Classic. his iconic role for me. So been in a lot of stuff. I mean, I, I can't he's even so think. So tough in that movie. He's tough in every movie. So ba. Just he's great. Just, he. I feel like I think I, th- I think I associate him being older than he really is. Uh huh. Because he just he seems yeah. so weathered in all of his movies. Right. He's, and even in this movie, as a as a teenager, he's like he's the big tough. Seventeen years old. Yeah. Like he. And I think one of the reasons why I I relate to this movie is because I see myself in Sean Astin and I have a big brother who was big and <laughs> more than once I did something dumb to some kid down the street and, and my brother came to my rescue and yeah. like and pushed a kid down see, and I said don't pick brother. on my yeah okay yeah. but but see like I think that's this movie draws you in because it's you there's identify. somebody here you can identify yeah. with Completely and, and I love like this I love my brother and I love remembering the times where he he saved me from getting beat up in the and the park where we used to play so uh just a, a very very quick plot synopsis for anybody that didn't didn't heed our advice and go watch the movie uh <clears throat> you know so so mikey and uh brand walsh are sean astin and and josh brolin brand what a cool name what a cool yeah i never yeah. i would have ne- it's, it's short for brandon okay i didn't know and i would have never thought brand as a short for brandon but it's yeah. cool right so i'm so, sorry go on so mikey and brand are Brothers, whose dad is the museum curator in Astoria, Oregon, where this shot was uh, was filmed, and <clears throat> they they discover along with their kind of the, the 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 group of friends that Mikey has, or they call themselves the Goonies. Okay, um, they find One-Eyed Willie's treasure map in their dad's museum artifacts in the attic. One-Eyed Willie, yeah, he was the most famous pirate in his time. My dad told me all about him once. One-Eyed Willie being a famed 7th century pirate, you know, I guess who's a legend in the area. Mm -hmm. And they go on an adventure to find One-Eyed Willie's treasure. Yeah. It leads them through caves all under the underbelly of Astoria, Oregon. And we end up in this, you know, this magical cavern with One-Eyed Willie's ship and and hidden in this cave. Lord knows how it got there. Yeah. You know, it's not relevant to the story. (laughs) And so it is a series of, of... adventures through this cave where they're running from this crime family of the Fratellis who's chasing them. Right. I'm not real sure why they're chasing them. Who's the mom from throw mama from the train. (laughs) So classic. So we got the Fratellis chasing the kids through the, through the caves and just one kind of little booby trap after another, where they've got to work through these clues to decipher their way through the end of the map. They find the ship with, with one eyed Willie's treasure. The Fratellis catch up with them. And chase him off. The somehow I'm not real sure. The ship is freed. The cave opens up, and all the kids make it back to the security of their families who are waiting for them somehow on the beach. <laughs> and uh, just so happens that after the Fratellis made them turn out their pockets of their of their treasure, sure um, one kid has I don't remember who it was right now, but has a has a pocket full of like rubies and, and yeah. emeralds. Right, and so everyone's saved. Very traditional '80s, happily ever after. Happily ever after. What's One eyed Willie's treasure ship flows up. So one of the things that I, out of all of the things in the Goonies that are completely unrealistic. Mm-hmm. You want the one, and there's one, a lot of them. A lot of them. Yeah. So we talked about the warmth and, and the relationship between between Mikey and Brand as being very real, mm-hmm. and that you can identify with. Yeah, really. All the rest of this movie is complete '80s, you know. Yeah. Typical. Typical fantasy fiction. Right. The one thing that's always, but I, I can I can live with all the rest of this fantasy that's not realistic, like uh-huh. and, and enjoy it and right. completely be engaged in it. Yep. The thing that bothers me the most. Is why nobody would have gotten a boat and gone and tracked down One Eyed Willie's treasure ship. It right. just sails into the distance and they're like smiling, like it's <laughs> there it goes. Ladies and gentlemen, we're at Cauldron Point and what appears to be a pirate ship with like all a, these with, treasures, with a gazillion dollars worth of doubloons in it, right? And n- like unmanned, no one thinks about and like 
community property, right? Like no one owns it. Like right. nobody thinks about maybe tracking down like a little speedboat and going right. and like raiding it. Maybe we should we should rank Goonies floating too. Around somewhere. You want to go write Goonies too? You want to go? That's an that's even better. Instead of writing Goonies too, the let's sl- go on an adventure to find, find one I'd really ship. this this <laughs> ship that's at sea. Maybe that's a metaphor we can see. Yeah, it's our treasure is still floating it still is in the distance, us. and it's it's lost at sea. Our treasure is lost at sea. So one thing that I found was interesting about this movie. Now that we've kind of given this plot synopsis, and my biggest gripe with the uh, with the plot, I still can't. I still can't, nobody went to track that boat down. Yeah. <laughs> so one thing, as as somebody who considers him to be a very very amateur filmmaker, I, I I find interesting about this movie is when I researched it, this movie was shot almost entirely in sequence. So if something is shot in sequence, that means that the order in which the scenes are scripted is the order in which it was filmed. Yeah. Which never happens. Right. It's it's logistically nearly impossible. They did that to like help the kids stay in character, right? Yes, and it's so brilliant because you've got an act, you know, all of these kids, you know, except for maybe Feldman, it was their acting debuts. Yeah. Uh, who's the girl that was in Summer Rental? Is, is her name Carrie Green? Did I get that right? Yeah. I'm uh-huh. guy? Yep. Um, Carrie Green. I had a crush on her when I was a kid. Who didn't? Right? Summer Rental is a good movie, too. Yeah. Um, anyway, it's all, I think it was her acting debut as well, mm-hmm. I think. Um, yep. So Josh Brolin... Martha Plimpton. Debut. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, yeah. uh, all those kids being young actors to get very authentic reactions from them. They filmed this movie in sequence and didn't necessarily, from what I've, from what I understand. So Spielberg, if you're listening to this and I'm wrong, <laughs> feel free to correct me. I would love to have you on the show. Um, <laughs> I, I've, from what I've heard is they, they let the kids in on very little of the script before. That's cool. That's a great idea. So they shot it in sequence. And so they're, so it didn't give anything away. Yeah. So you shoot scene one. Hey, kids, this is what you need to do and say. Yeah. And so out of that, you get scenes like like probably my favorite scene from the movie where where Sean, uh, Sean Astin monologues in the, in the, in the well. Yeah, so, mine too. It, it's, it's their time up there. Down yeah. here, it's our time. It's our time down here. Right. Our parents, they want the best of stuff for us. But right now, they got to do what's right for them. Because it's their time. Their time. Up there. Down here, it's our time. It's our time down here. That's all over the second we ride up Troy's bucket. Um, that was more or less ad-libbed. Like they said, this really? is what we want you to say. And he didn't memorize lines. They just said, this is the spirit of it. Shoved him out there it. and turned the cameras on and said... Give that, it your best That's go. really cool. And I love that you said that's your favorite scene because it was by far my favorite scene because you, you really get to peek into this kid who, who has a sense of adventure and he wants to do good and he wants to save his family and he, he wants all these things. But there's like a real kid in there that's, that's scared yeah, but so also excited. It's, that, it's like the, the intersection of inhaler and adventure in this movie. Yeah, right, exactly. So it's like he's got a chance to get out. Yeah. You know, Troy's bucket is on its way down. Right. Or but, you continue with danger. But the other metaphor to that is Troy's bucket is on his way down, but Troy is at the top of yeah, the well. That's true. We don't want to deal with Troy either. So it's, yeah, you got the you, Fratelli's, One-Eyed Willie's traps, or, or Troy. Yeah. So very cool scene. Um, so, so, more, so I've got, I don't know if you read through this. Yeah, I added this late last night. There's a few stories that I found on this. And yeah. If you read the intro, you, you heard me say that I really like working in some of these behind the scenes stories. Into mm-hmm. it. Yeah, I love it. So, so speaking of shooting this movie in sequence and the kids really kind of getting genuine reactions by not knowing the script ahead of time. Uh huh. The the coolest visual of the story is One Eyed Willie's treasure or his his boat, mm-hmm. One Eyed Willie's ship in the cave. Um, the the production team and specifically from what I've read, uh, Steven Spielberg forbid the kids from seeing it they completely blocked off that filming location the kids were not to see that while it was in production yeah they wanted their genuine reaction when they came up out of the water and saw the ship for the first time yeah and josh brolin ruined it really completely tanked it and and from i've read interviews with josh brolin that say yeah i think to this day steven spielberg doesn't care for me because i ruined this thing (laughs) so so everybody all the kids reactions were perfect you know wide-eyed and oh my gosh they come up out of the water and they see the boat and Josh Brolin yells, oh, F-bomb. <laughs> and so uh, 17-year-old Josh Brolin goes in a different direction than maybe 14 or 15-year-old other kids. Right. Drops the F-bomb. Steven Spielberg yells cut, and his, 
his whole idea to surprise the kids and get their genuine reaction is ruined. Do you, do you think that Josh, like, okay, he's been messing with us this whole time. I'm just, I'm going to ruin his back. shot. I like, I hope so. <laughs> it makes it better if he did. Right. So yeah, shoot, shot in sequence, which is very difficult logistically, but for the sake of, of bringing along kid actors with this story and getting, I think it's, I think it's really cool. Yeah. Um, so little tidbits there on the Josh Brolin story and the, the filming and sequence thing that you might not have gotten otherwise. Mm -hmm. So one more reason to keep listening to the Telling Stories podcast with Andrew Crabtree and Rick Maxidon. Yeah. So when we look at this movie as a, uh, you know, and it's, and it's Christian influence or it's, or it's gospel influence, if you will, that we kind of talked through some of these elements last week, this falls into more of the allegorical. Yeah. The more, the more hard literal, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, even watching this as a kid, I, I kind of, and, and I don't think this is reaching, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on this, but I, I saw the Goonies tri trip through the caves and their adventure to find one eyes Willie treasure. I, I found it almost like an allegory to our journey as Christians. Yeah, we're, absolutely. We're introduced to the gospel, mm -hmm. and we kind of start this journey, not really knowing what we're getting into, we, we, we on this journey discovering Christ, and, and we're following this kind of, blueprint left to us by mm -hmm. by in the bible in ancient document yes um I, and we come to this point where we're either going to be all in and we're going to accept salvation right or we're going to go back to the world yeah and so our, we're talking about you know our favorite scene where they're in the well and yeah. you've got the decision are you going up troy's bucket and back to the world or are you going to continue on the journey to, to find your treasure yeah and uh so, of course, they, they follow the treasure. So, I, I th the, to me, that was a pivotal moment for so many reasons. One, because Sean Astin's monologue was great. Yeah. And the visuals are cool, like all these coins in right. the water. And yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a great visually, and it's, it's thematically great. But, like, to me, it was just this intersection of, do I keep fighting the fight and commit? Right. Or do I fall back to the world? And I think we're all, we all have that. Like, we have that fork in the road all the time with some sort of Every frequency day. and and we we have the choice and sometimes we choose correctly and sometimes we choose incorrectly but the path is still leading us and and that's i think the beauty of the gospel is even failures continue to push us down the right direction and there were failures on the road to the, for the yeah, and i think too to to add in here is there there are really two things two two things that that are are driving or are are trying to keep them from their end task. Yeah. One is is their their physical human enemies, the Troy Fratellis. to an extent, yeah. but but mostly the Fratellis are are trying to uh, like impede their progress. impede their progress. Yeah. That's right, and and they're doing lots of things to keep them from doing it. But uh, and so there's there's a very real enemy that they have. But then there's also like the circumstances that they find themselves in, and not just the booby traps, yeah. which is a metaphor for like. We're walking around this earth that's broken and not the way it's supposed to be. That, like, we can easily trip and sin, and we can easily trip yeah. and do things that, that will break us or hurt yeah. us or keep us from our task and all that. So there's there's that piece, but but there's not just the the brokenness of our of our world that's that those those booby traps, but there's things that are along the way that booby trap us but ultimately they keep us alert they keep us aware they keep us aware of our, our circumstances and so like i see parallels to, to scripture all over that like we have one i've said many times in sermons we have one enemy and his name is satan and the only weapon that he has is to get us to believe something that's not true like the fratellis we know at the end of this movie they're that that the goonies are going to get what they they're they're after mm-hmm no matter what's happening and but there, there's beauty in and what we see and then all along the way they're being tested yep. but they're passing the test and they're being made stronger by the test to get to where they're they're going to be yeah and and like even maybe maybe a little less literal but like i think even like drawing strength from each other's like it wasn't just one goonie right it wasn't just sean astin's character on the journey yeah. he had there, there was a there was a body of believers right going through this together yeah and drawing strength from each other and, and eventually yeah. finding the goal together and Sean Astin is is young and small but his brother is big and strong and has this protective instinct and he's essential like the the story they don't get to where they get without the the strength of the brother or the resourcefulness yeah. of uh, 
uh, data. Yeah, yeah. They don't they don't Great get where character. they're going without the 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 resourcefulness of that, or they don't get where they're going without you know chunk the the fat kid being able to engage and have fun with for sloth yeah. with sloth and like so they're everybody's playing an essential role you uh so to, to depart for just a moment yeah and bring some lightness back in a little yeah bit. so i'm sorry i get deep no man. no it, i love it all right and good. i want i want this to be that good. but i've got a little story here that i, I like to be a guy that works in stories from okay. off camera it's a so podcast you, you brought on up, stories you brought up data okay okay who's played by jonathan k kwan okay okay where, if I if I if you, if you picture that kid's face, what did you what do you know him from? He's the he's short round, right? He's right. short round from Indiana Jones. The yeah, Family. right. Great, Which is a Spielberg. Great, yeah, right. Another Spielberg movie. Not, very similar. I forgot that he was in this. Yeah, very similar adventure yeah. to this. Um, and he he's playing the same character yeah, basically. He is. So so Jonathan K. Kwan told his mother before filming started that he would not swear because you know if you I I didn't really think about this so much when I was a kid but watching it as an adult I'm like these kids cuss a lot in this movie right not yeah. like bad like no they're not and I wonder like I saw this as situational a, like why didn't my parents let me see yeah, this I had the same thought yeah um, and so Data promised his mom he wouldn't swear like the other kids so okay. there's one scene where he's about to fall into a booby trap I think there's like some boulders falling from the ceiling a, a booty trap or a Bo- booby, booby trap booby trap he says <laughs> he goes back very and forth different. throughout the whole yeah, movie that's right that's yeah. right he because he can't hardly say it. Booty trap. No, not booty. Booby trap. trap. Yeah. <laughs> Tina, where are you going? I'm setting booty traps. Booby traps. That's what I said. I'm setting booby traps in case of anybody's following us. Um, he told his mom he wouldn't swear, so the, these rocks are falling from the ceiling, and you hear his character say, "Holy S H I T." <laughs> and they kept it in the movie. Oh, that's because he because he his told mom. his mom he wouldn't swear, so he just spelled it out. <laughs> Holy S H I T. So, oh, fantastic! Uh, and I, and more the fact that he did that, I just love that yeah. they kept it. Wow. They kept it in the final. That's fantastic. All right, so have, now having departed and having a little fun with Data's character here, uh, I think just from comparing our notes here, there's there's something that I'm gr- I'm glad you put down here because I took it away, but I didn't put it in my notes. And so it, we talk about this this allegory and this journey. Um, I had kind of always seen One Eyed Willie basically playing the role of, of Jesus in this movie. Mm-hmm. And you, you put in here, you know, a quote, uh, you were the first Goonie and, and being an allusion to, to Jesus, you know, son of man who, yeah. who's, who, who set this path for us. Yeah. That's, that's really like, I was, I'm always looking for that in, in every, and that's kind of one of our stated goals for the podcast is to teach people to look for things in movies. Yeah. But like, I'm just inherently looking for stuff like that. And, and I'm, I'm I'm really like when the camera gets in close and we get close ups and there's there's quiet stuff happening in the film. I, I kind of draw into that and and when Sean Astin says you were the first Goonie to One Eyed Willie, so it's it's like no one else is in the room yet. It's just Sean talking to a skeleton. Yeah, and he says you were the first Goonie, and like my mind goes to scripture where the Son of Man or or the the first part of first john like before anything was you were um and and it's like it, it really I, I think it is a is a great picture of christ and he left this there, ancient document sim- for the one eyed willie left this ancient document for these right. kids to right. to help them through their journey and to find their right you know, and now hope. here Sean Aston is he's got the so the I always go back to the creation, fall, redemption, restoration, yeah. the, that cycle of story. The creation is, hey, we've got this great neighborhood with great friends. The fall is, there's going to be, they're going to bulldoze it. And the redemption is this this long process of them getting here. And now they're in the middle of this restoration. And it's it's the guy, Sean Astin, who is, his job has been to get to this point. And now we see this restoration. And it's just a, a simple little glimpse into the heart of this boy who is now getting to the place. And, and I think in, in movies like this, we don't always have one person that's filling the Christ role. We have several people that are filling the Christ role. And Sean Astin jumps into it sometimes. And then his big brother, Bran, jumps into it sometimes. And, mm-hmm. But for the most part, it's, it's One-Eyed Willie. And when he says, you were the original Goonie, it's yeah. like, yeah, it Jesus with me as well. is the, or, like, he came to, to our struggle. 
and and he knows the struggle, but he's defeated the struggle, and now he waits for you to come and find him. And he waits at the end of the journey with your with right. the eternal right. reward. Yeah, so and so there's like, like I'm more of a guy who's more interested in subtle thematic things, and so that sort of in your face allegory, like it doesn't quite do it sure. for me, but. When you see it, and when you think it, and when you allow your mind to chase it, it it really does. It really is kind of pretty. It's cool, and I genuinely don't think that Spielberg and Donner meant. Oh, I'm for sure this they did. Team didn't. to be in this movie, yeah. but to me, it's like it's so obvious that it slaps you in your face. But and that's where it goes back to what we said in the intro podcast, uh, the the Tolkien Lewis thing, is that every story is telling a deeper story, mm-hmm. and that deeper story is pointing to an even deeper story. Whether you and, mean for it to or not, right? You you can't help it because we're created in the image of God, and yeah. and we have this innate sense of of adventure, this innate sense to to find and follow something, and while we don't. Like not every story in our real lives in reality ends up with a pretty bow. We have this craving that wants it to, and we spend our money to go see movies that create it to. But uh, the, the thing is, is that we expect the lights to come up and we stand from our seats and pick up our, our popcorn and our soda trash and go throw it away and we go back into the real world. But there's a deeper reality, a deeper narrative in all of our stories. I literally couldn't have said it better myself. Yeah. Well, this was fun. I, I we took a, a tough, took a fun, lighthearted movie. Yeah. And we took some really deep symbolism out of it. Yeah. In a way that hopefully resonates with the audience. If it did, leave us a leave us a comment and tell us. We would love to love to hear if it meant anything to you. Um, <clears throat> next week's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm excited about this one. Dark, very different than the thematic. Goonies. Yeah. Almost the anti Goonies, if you will. Yeah. Uh, we next week we come back next week we will be releasing uh, the the, first, the third episode of the Telling Stories podcast uh, off of our time watching Manchester by the Sea, um, starring one of my favorite actors Casey Affleck. Yeah, really good. He won an Oscar for that role. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. We'll talk about that. A couple next week. Oscars for this movie. Yeah, very good movie. Yeah. Uh, we'll talk about that next week. Come back and get that. Um, I'm going to leave you with with one more little behind the scenes story just yeah. to put a bow on this episode because. Because like the movie, I think this, ep- this, this episode deserves a, a closed ending. Great. Maybe next week we'll leave the ending more open and just, Sounds cut, great. just cut the audio. Perfect. But uh, <laughs> just to put a bow on this, um, did your mom ever throw away anything when you were a kid that you would like just, Mom, why did you throw that away? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so Sean Astin was allowed to keep the original copy of One-Eyed Willie's treasure map from the set. Like the, no, the you're going to tell me that his, his mom, mom threw it away? threw it away years later thinking it was oh. trash. Oh, uh, you know how much that'd be worth? Oh my goodness, tens of thousands at least. Yeah, and just the sentiment that it's worth. Oh my gosh, be, being his first feature film. Yeah, yeah. So his mom threw it away out of his room, thinking it was trash. The Let lesson to you kids to keep your rooms clean, and if you like something, don't don't put it somewhere right. your mom's gonna. Find yeah, it. and and also a lesson, kids, don't blame your mom for everything. Sean should have taken better care of it. You don't just leave the treasure hey, mom, map. This is the treasure map from the movie. Don't it throw be it away. Framed in some kind of like right, yeah. right. So, Last thing, um, just for a level of authenticity, the uh, the production team after they finished the the prototype for the One Eyed Willie's map, um, they thought it was missing something. So one of the uh, production assistants cut his hand open and literally sp- sprinkled his real blood over the map. <laughs> they not, did not fake blood. Not they didn't have eye. some Hollywood map. You would have thought. Blood. They said he was just so close, and they just nicked his hand and sprinkled his blood on it. All right. So, well, and that's in some landfill somewhere because Sean Aston left it sitting around. <laughs> Maybe that's our next adventure <laughs> to find we'll the find landfill. The one-eyed Willie's trick. <laughs> we'll find his boat by finding the map. There we go. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, podcast audience. That genuinely means, I know your time's worth a lot, so it genuinely means a, a lot to me that you listen to us ramble on about the Goonies for a little bit here. Uh, if you haven't seen the movie, go do it. It's great. Uh, come back next week for Manchester by the Sea, where we will have a lot of fun going in a completely different direction with this podcast. So thank you so much, and we'll see you next week.